We are back now with a deep dive into one of the most serious crises they they facing people. To three in heroin overdoses. Heroin is being one of called them. America's biggest drug Opiates. epidemic. Now the number one killer of the people. Opioid under crisis. More people die from and that than from carbon. Die overdose deaths have never been high for opioid-related issues. The only way to solve the drug problem is through toughness. We know that drugs and crime go hand in hand. We will find you, we will arrest you. What we need is to declare a war on drugs. You drug dealers are going to prison. Politicians get to look tough and they get to look like we're protecting the public from these drug addicts, from these junkies, from these criminals. This is costing the United States economy $504 billion a year. The social punishment affects people disproportionately according to class and race even more. If you ask, is the war on drugs a success or a failure? If you judge it by its declared aims, it's an abject, indisputable, documented failure and always has been. If I had to design a system to keep addiction going on a massive scale, I'd design the present war on drugs. A drug bust today. It's the worst epidemic I've ever seen. We're dealing in heroin, cocaine. We have to get tougher. Law enforcement is a part of the use. Drug addicts with spiral into addiction. We are dying. And that toughness includes the death penalty. So there's no war on drugs. There's a war on drug addicts, is what there is. And it really is a war. I tried meth the first time when I was 12. My aunts and uncles were meth heads, and my dad left when I was five. My mom was a heroin addict. She wasn't locked up all the time like I was, but her drugs took first place, so. My grandmother raised me for the most part. She worked a lot and traveled for her work, and my uncle and my aunt were always tweaked out. So I still raised myself and just pretty much did whatever, so. Why do you need to be numbed? a childhood trauma. And we see that the addiction is not a primary problem at all. It's an attempt to solve a problem. It's the attempt to solve the problem of emotional emptiness, of emotional pain, of isolation. That to think that addiction is a choice anybody makes is absolute nonsense. The very first time it was juvenile time and it was drugs. Bunch of drugs, bunch of different kinds of drugs. The second time was guns and drugs and violence, assault, and then the third time was guns and drugs and bail jumping. I've been to Pierce County Jail 19 times. I've been to jail in California four or five times. I've been to jail in Colorado. I've been to jail in New Mexico. I've been to prison three times, about 10 years total. I don't feel that I would have been in prison if I wouldn't have had a problem with drugs, because I wouldn't have been carrying guns if I wasn't selling drugs and using drugs. If there was any evidence that locking people up for ever longer periods of time is reducing drug trade, is reducing drug violence, is reducing drug use. You might make a case for it, but there's no such case to be made. If we're incarcerating people for longer and longer, we're not doing it because there's any proof that it's going to do any good. We're doing it because it satisfies our political purposes. We're not increasing the safety of our children, of ourselves, or of our society. The more childhood adversity there is, the greater the risk of addiction. Because that's the source of the pain that people try to escape from, that's the source of the disconnection and the emptiness that people try to soothe. And that also is what shapes the human brain. My mom and my dad had split up. I had never known them to be together. My father, he was an intravenous meth user. It was probably about seven when I first started drinking. We'd run and we'd sneak, we'd grab a beer out of the cooler and we'd take off running and we'd chug it. We'd do that all night until we were shit-faced. But the first time I used meth, I was probably 13 years old. It was kind of a dope house and I used meth with one of the people there. So when you look at brain scans, what you actually look at is the impact of childhood experience because all the circuits that are involved in addiction in the addicted brain are uh, heavily affected by childhood trauma. We started hitchhiking and we got picked up. The guy was giving us a ride to the next little town. My friend actually reached around and grabbed the dude by his throat and told him to pull over. And the guy pulled over, threw him out of the vehicle, and then took his car. Went three or four miles before we crashed. 
I went through the windshield and the car went off the road. It was a terrible wreck. Split my head open, split the side of my face open. Woke up in the hospital with first degree armed robbery charges. I was still 17 years old at the time. I mean, I've been to prison six times. Each time there's been multiple charges. So I got convicted of seven crimes the last time I went to prison from possession of stolen property to identity theft to forgery. And every other time I went to prison, you gotta figure it average about three charges. So it's probably over 20 felony charges, a couple of violent crimes on there, but it was all drug induced. Criminality follows in the wake of increased drug use when the drugs are criminalized. Well, in the U.S., you have increased attack on drug addicts and increased attacks on the criminality that's caused by the drug laws. I just turned 22. It was born on my first prison sentence when I was in uh, receiving units. I had just left county and I was sitting in Shelton. The guard came by at one o'clock in the morning and told me, you got a boy in and out of his life. Six times I've been locked up, screwed up. I created a bitterness and resentment in his heart. So he's a drug addict as well. And he's lost in his addiction. So I feel helpless and hopeless when it comes to my son. I feel like there's nothing I can do. You know, you're either gonna die or you're gonna go to prison, right? And I think that the, that catalyst is pain. Nobody's ever identified a single gene that determines a single mental health condition. There was the famous discovery of the alcoholism gene in the 1990s. Front page news in all the, in all the media turned out to be totally false. Are there some genes that predispose to addiction? Probably there are but they're not addiction genes. Because if something is explainable by genes, we don't have to look at the social circumstances, the social policies, the economic inequality, the racism, the stress on young families, the lack of support for uh, women during pregnancy. We can just blame it all on the genes. So it's a very elegant pseudoscientific uh, bypass of reality. So I got to this presentation. Here was Ari doing a presentation about post-prison education, about going back to school, being whatever you wanted to be. So I was like, wow, this is it. This is the answer to my prayers. But then from that point on, he was just blowing up our phones. And I wouldn't stop calling. And eventually I said, stop calling, you're in. I think what I told him was, if you'll just, if you'll get off the damn phones and leave us alone, we'll help, right? <laughs> the next morning after I'd gotten out of prison, Ari was at the door told me to get in the car and drove me to Pierce College, walked me through registration. And before we left the campus, I had an opportunity grant that paid for classes that day. So three days after I got out, I was in a college class, brand new quarter, starting school. And somebody cared that didn't have to care. Post-prison education program is a nonprofit that helps people coming out of prison be the system that is stacked against them that the odds are just so incomprehensibly stacked against them that without assistance, most people don't make it. It involves wraparound services and housing and tuition and books and counseling, and paying bills, legal financial obligations, buying groceries, bus passes. But the main thing that makes the program work is the people that work in the office. So it's a combination of peer counseling or people who have their master's degree in psychology or master's degree in social work or licensed counselors, undergrad degree in psychology, a law degree. So it's having people in the office that can mentor former prisoners and help them along the way. If people are brought up in homes where they were abused, they, they develop learning difficulties, and they have the skills to survive, they need skill training. Training uh, how to interact with other people when it's not over drugs. But when you look at who are the ones who end up in the courts for drug addiction, they're the children that weren't rescued. We're punishing the people that we didn't support when they were small. Now the problem is that most addiction programs, well-meant addiction programs, expensive addiction programs, do not address the issue of trauma. The average medical student, even today, does not even hear the word trauma when they go to medical school. And addiction programs just don't get this because they're not trained in this perspective, despite the voluminous research that would support a trauma-based approach. These are human beings. People in our jails and prisons are potentially our family, our friends, our neighbors, our colleagues. 
who are hurting, they're hurting from trauma and who only look to drugs to ease pain. The last time that I was in, I went to one of the seminars that they come into the prison, told Ari some of my war stories, and I asked for help from Ari in the program. The, the, the presentation just lit a fire under her and she started blowing up the phones. She wanted to go to Bates Technical College and she wanted to get her kids back and she wanted to be a welder. I'd never asked for help before. It was humbling to ask for help because I needed help. Initially, they helped me get a place, helped me with rent so that I could go to school full time and um, helped me with groceries, helped me with phone bills, helped me with all the paperwork in college, which was like, if I wouldn't have had their support in that, I probably would have like freaked out and walked off. They helped me with all my welding equipment, made sure I had all the stuff that I needed in my books for school so that I could succeed. We go into prisons, do quarterly presentations. Depending on the, the age of the prison and just the physical plant, we might meet with 300 men in a visit room at uh, the prison out at Aberdeen or 110 men at the prison out at Connell. And for two and a half, three hours, we talk to them about post-secondary education and how we work and basically uh, give them hope where I think none exists. We walk in with some people who maybe have done 20 years and are successful and happy in their lives. And maybe the prisoners even know these people right, because they've been locked up with them in previous years. We've got a graduate who's an emergency room registered nurse. Another post-prison graduate is now the president of the Washington, Alaska NAACP. A graduate who's working with the YMCA as a youth advocate and amazing mentor. One of our graduates is working as an electrical engineer. A graduate is working as an HVAC technician. We have a student currently at Seattle Central College who's a much loved and valued employee here in our office. One of the graduates is a commercial diver. You know, they're like blown away that this person was 40 felony convictions, 15 years imprisonment and six imprisonments, is, has college degrees, is married, just bought a house, is having an amazing life. And so it's a wake up call for them. The Department of Corrections has been a really good partner. And, and, and I choke on it. I choke on saying that any prison system has been a good partner of this nonprofit, but they have. Uh, and, and the way they've done that is they've given us access to prisoners. If you look at the current um, opioid epidemic in the States, where is it most prevalent? It's most prevalent where working class people have lost their jobs, where the communities have been destroyed. The social punishment affects people disproportionately, according to class and race, even more. I'm a welder fitter. We repair boats and barges and ships. I just wanted more for my children, and I, I needed help to be able to be that person to give it to them. I wake up at like 3.15, 3.20, go throw a cup of coffee in the microwave, the restroom real fast, gather all my daughter's stuff, take it outside, warm the car up, put the stuff in the car so it's already there, come back in, get dressed, throw all the dogs outside, come back in the house, brush my teeth, wash my face, go back outside, clean the kennels real fast, fill up their water, come back in the house, take my daughter's slippers, her coat, and her blanket upstairs, put all that stuff on her, wrap her up, and take her out to the car. Take her over to my brother, put her back to sleep on his couch, get back in the car, race back home, the car and then my day starts here. It's going to be a Bachelor of Arts with an emphasis in social work. The Evergreen State College in Olympia. Right now we're learning about the school to prison pipeline. Some of the texts are pathways to adulthood for disadvantaged young men. Basically learning all about marginalized populations. A lot of that is my exposure to post-prison education program and a different life, like I met Ari and all of a sudden took me to the Windermere Cup, UW volleyball, women's volleyball games, the opera, things that I've never experienced. I, I wanna go into re-entry in some way, shape or form, either working with youth coming out or still in, or men and women coming out of prison. Three out of four people go back to prison after, eventually, uh, because prison wasn't the solution. I didn't want my children to look back 
at their childhood and have some of the memories that I have. Fallon's awesome. She's my girl. She's had the chance not to experience any of that from her mommy because I've been clean the whole time since I've had her, so. I'm not sure what the future holds. I know what it doesn't hold. Another prison sentence for me, so I'm all right. I'm gonna be all right. Now, what the war on drugs does is it stresses people to the extreme. It ostracizes them, it criminalizes them, it marginalizes them, it forces them into a subterranean world of constant insecurity and uh, economic distress. In the US, every three weeks now, you have the equivalent of a 9-11 in terms of the number of people dying of overdoses. So harm reduction has to be part of the spectrum of treatment. What if we actually had a rational conversation about how we approach addictions? Is it sensible to incarcerate all these people? Where could that money go? If we weren't spending it on mass incarceration, look at all the good that we could do in prevention and rehabilitation and harm reduction. You can't separate treatment of addiction from the larger social issues. I think the potential is enormous, and if there's any benefit to the current crisis, it's maybe that a lot more people are waking up to the dire need of a new look at this whole issue.